Hello and welcome to episode 40 of 177 Nations of Tasmania. I'm Mark Thompson. Imagine you're 15 years old and your parents send you to a country on the other side of the world where you don't speak a word of the language. For many of us, this seems unthinkable. But this is what happened to Nick, who was raised on the island of Lesbos, Greece, which was at the time in the throes of a violent civil struggle just after World War II. He eventually joined the thousands of other Greeks who settled in Tasmania in the 50s and 60s and came to form one of Tasmania's most prominent and successful migrant communities. Please listen in to hear more about Nick's remarkable journey to be here. Where did you grow up in Greece? In my school days in Greece, I was in an island named Lesbos. Mytilene is the capital of Lesbos. And uh, that's where... I was uh, 15 before I moved out to come to Australia. And what sort of life was it back in those days? That's, it was very bad mm-hmm. those days because it was the end of the Second World War and then the locals start right and left wing. <laughs> the locals start with having, killing each other themselves. Mm. So otherwise the World well, we finished, but the war the, 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 well, in there was still going on. And all the young people wanted to get away. So was that conflict between just local Greek people? Two different, uh, what you call... Uh, oh, so, so, so polit- different politics. Politics, left wing and right wing. Yeah. And that's the last few years. But uh, a lot of young, gen- young ones. Uh, and when you see them, so many, you know, try to get away so you think how much as well try and go myself, you know. Yeah. But uh, for me to come here then, because I was too young to let me come, uh, I had to get a special, uh, uh, what do you call the... Uh, oh, like a special permission or... Because I was underage. And... Uh, and uh, my father knew somebody. Then asked me if his son can send me one of them so I can go over. Oh, okay. So you, you had like a, a special permission to to leave on your own. But it was quite a <laughs> up and down trip, you know, because my, everything was arranged after a few months, and uh, my father is taking me to. Athens, Piraeus, to get into the, to the, in the bath. It was wintry, very cold and miserable. But the bath was left a couple of days earlier. All right. So I had to get, uh, after a few days, I had to put me in a small plane, go to Alexandria, and somebody else come and pick me up from the aeroplane. He put me into a, a train to send me to... Port side. Oh, port side. Yeah. Port side. And after two, three days, the boat come and go in. And after 28, 29 days, we reach Melbourne. So why did your father, was it your father who chose to send you away? Yeah. And why did he choose, why did he think Australia was a good place? Well, uh, listen to other rest of the town, you know, talking about how... Can be, could be any worse than what Greece was then. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when we had the certificate and uh, took me to, to Athens, he gave me 15 pounds, which you had to sell all the olive oil. That's the only pro- pro- product we had there to sell the oil. Right. Get enough money to pay for me to come over. So is that what your what your family did? They were made olive oil? Yes, and... and other things, you know, to the own bread and uh, veggies and fruit and all that. Okay. So, like, f- farmers, or was that just the way they Sort lived? of. Sort of. A bit of everything. Yeah. So he gave me the $15 and his blessing, and uh, off I come. And uh, while I was in Portside, there was a lot of uh, street sellers. So I didn't have any watch. I had no watch, I never had, and uh, I love watch, to buy one. And uh, the, of course the street sellers there, they come by the dozen, uh, try mm-hmm. to sell you things. And I pay uh, three or four pounds and bought a watch. 
I was so happy about it. After two weeks, it didn't stop working. Yeah. <laughs> and they said to somebody, well, what oh, stopped? They said, well, chuck it out. He said, they're no good. <laughs> yeah. So, well, three or four pounds, that's like 20% uh, of the money you had. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. But the arrangement was this person from, Mel from Sydney to come to Melbourne and mm -hmm. pick me up because the ship stopped in Melbourne, then go to Sydney. And the ship wasn't very good ship there. There was banks in the one on top of the other inside. It was terrible. But I didn't know any better. <laughs> I've never been in the ship before. Yeah, so yeah. If you don't know any better, you're right. But when we got to Melbourne, very early in the morning, everybody up with the suitcases to get out. And a uh, lot of women, not men, right, a lot of men, with the photographs in the hands of the women they brought in young, uh, to marry, you know. The yeah, yeah. So they'd arranged it arrange, back marriage. in Europe. Yes, and uh, most of them, they have a photo and they're all looking. <laughs> so meeting, they were meeting for the first time. Yeah, the first yeah. time. And a couple hours, everybody's gone, you know, it's empty. The, mm -hmm. the port, hardly anybody there. After hours and hours, I uh, thought I better get back in the ship, but they wouldn't, wouldn't let me. So you're going through the customs, so you can't go back. I had a small suitcase and overcoat on the other hand, and wait and wait, and then uh, a youth come, a utility pull up, and I had to talk in Greek, because I, I didn't know not a single word of English. So I approached them and talked to them, and. I told them, you know, somebody was supposed to come and pick me up, and they didn't come. And they asked me if I want them to drop me in town, in the city. Well, I, I didn't know any better. I, yes, drop me in the city. They showed me this Greek restaurant say, there. So I went to the restaurant. It was a cubicle there. I sit down, and I had a look, what can I have with three shillings? And they wouldn't need have, having breakfast or anything in you know, the, the morning to get out quick. And uh, a gentleman came and sit in the same cubicle and he looked at me and he said, what are you doing here on your own? Mm. And I told him what's happening. When the food came, he ordered some more for me. He paid for it. And uh, I said, well, you want to come with me? I said, I don't know. Next door was door of staircase going up. And it was a great club, mm -hmm. a restaurant, a club. It was uh, after lunch, late afternoon. And uh, we went up the club, and he called someone, maybe middle 20s, I suppose, and he gave him five pounds. And uh, he, he asked me first if he had got the, any address or name where the person, the one I'm supposed to come and pick me up. And I did have his name and address and telephone. So he gave him five, he gave the fellow five pounds and asked him to take me to the railway station, get a ticket to Sydney, and ask what time the train gets to Sydney, and send the telegraph, go to the post office and send the telegraph, which he did. He put me in the train, and uh, when I got to Sydney, that fellow came and picked me up. He reckoned he, he had somebody to pick me up if it didn't come or something, so I don't know. And that was in the Oxford Street, opposite Town Hall, the Town Hall there. There was um, Takiwai Milk Bar. I worked there, I had a room upstairs for me to live in, I worked downstairs. And after a few months, I found a better job and slowly better and better. So what was it like though, um, coming to a new country and not speaking the language? It wasn't very good. Sometimes I had a few tears running mm -hmm. down sometimes. At uh, my own, you know, on the room there, and nobody to talk, nothing to... Even if you want to talk to the locals, you no, know, I didn't know any English. Yeah. But as soon as I started learning my first... Uh, first my English still very bad, because... <laughs> I should be much better with... Uh, anyway. Then from then on, I moved around. When I was uh, 17, I borrowed 400 pounds from somebody 
friend of mine to the, somebody told me there's a shop in uh, the end of Newcastle. So you bought a bought a business in in Hobart, yeah, the Piccadilly. And so, how did you get started in in Tasmania, and what was your sort of first experiences? Well, we know about. I was good outside the shop, and the other fellow was good in the in the kitchen, cook, and we know each other very well. And uh, it's still here that fellow. His, his children got the Sandy Bay Bakery. You know, we were the business together, and we, we did well, because those days was about 500 Greeks working for Hydro. And every weekend, they would come to Hobart, and they want to spend, they eat, drink, play cards, and spend money. Yeah. And their business was doing well. We give them good food and service, and club upstairs, restaurant downstairs, and uh, we involved in uh, build soccer club and uh, with uh, the others here yeah, there was in the community, you know, in big, big community. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what, what was the Greek community like at that time? Was it sort of a, a big, it sounds like it was a quite a big Big, big community. and uh, very together, you know, the working all together and uh, Greek. Strong, strong community. Yeah. We build the church, we build the... Today, the new generation they've got different ideas. Everything. In all communities. In all communities. So do your, um, your children and grandchildren speak Greek still? Not the grandchildren so much. Some yeah. of them. Yanni, Yanni speaks... Uh, Greek, good Greek, because his grandparents didn't know much English, so some of them do, some not. Yeah, but, uh, because there's still a, there's, there's still a Greek uh, school in Hobart, isn't there? Yeah, for the kids, uh, school kids. But when they grow up and uh, start the boyfriend, girlfriend, and all that, then they speak <laughs> English. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess there are just uh, less Greek people in Hobart to speak to compared to when you were here. There would have been a lot more. Well, there's more. The different generation. Yeah. Not the same. Yeah, who, and they've all, they've all grown up in Australia. Yes, of course. I'm talking about late 50s until now, you know, how many years that do you work at? <laughs> 50, 60 years or whatever. And so at that, at that time, um, did you feel that uh, people, people here were welcoming of Greek Greeks? Was, was it easy to sort of adapt to life here? Oh, yes, yes. We used to have dances, we had to have cinemas, Greek cinemas, we had to, we had to show them at... Uh, Top of Elizabeth Street. Oh, okay, the old the state cinema. Yes, uh, every once a week or once a fortnight, they used to send the, the connections from Sydney. They send the film. Okay, so Greek yeah. films. Yeah. Yeah. So you were able to sort of still sort of practice Greek culture and customs at that time. Yes, we had the priest come then, Pater Pamias. Mm -hmm. And he uh, was a lovely man, and he uh, started start getting married with the young ones who were all grow up, and weddings and parties and all that, picnics. So they used to, there were some photos, uh, we used to hire a bus once or twice a month and to the with different uh, uh, people running the, the ladies' committee, you know, different committees. 
in the, but they all was belong to one committee. Mm-hmm. They, had the, uh, the big one and the others were subcommittees, you know. And yeah. It was very well organized and uh, was very strong, doing very well and uh, now the different kettle of fish. <laughs> yeah, I guess the um, the people who were organising it before, there's just not as many many people who are motivated. Most of them dead now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and no one to repl- no one to replacing them. No, that compared with other migrants. We are right, Greeks, I think, is still a bit, well, you know, the church, Sunday church, usually you see there 50 or more people, ordinary Sundays, mm-hmm. which is okay. But the, the new generation, the young ones, you know, the, there's a school, there's a, well, the last couple of, Two three weeks, uh, they had a couple of bazooki nights mm-hmm. in, at the club there yeah. for the young ones, and I believe they had, they was quite good. Yeah, so there's still some sort of young young people of Greek heritage who will to practice some traditions. Yeah. Oh yes, they they they, they teach us uh, teach them to dance proper Greek dances. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and is it uh, important f- for you that these some of these old traditions? From oh, we like to keep uh, as long as as, we, as long as we can. Well, I think I think it's nice to yeah. keep it going. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And you mentioned a little bit about what your parents did in. Mitalini. When we were growing up, what what was your what did your family live live from? Like, what was their business, or what was their work? The paddocks. There were uh, some paddocks, five acres, ten acres, two mm-hmm. acres, and they just grow whatever they can to, and uh, they exchange. Ah, okay. So if like you, a- if you grow one something else, and I grow something else. I give you some for mine, you give you some for Ah, okay, so a and barter system. Well, they, they help each other, exchange. And the island, my island, the mine product is uh, olive oil. It's uh, got, I think it's got about 12 million olive trees on the wow. island. So that's the main, the main industry? Well, the, for instance, uh, the, they used to grow wheat just enough for them to make their own bread. Okay. Before. But now I don't think anybody makes the bread. They pay for the, you buy the bread now. Yeah. And things like that, you know. You have a, a couple of goats, goats at home, a little, little pair of there, small, and you used to make your own cheese, yogurt, chooks to have eggs and chicken eggs. And also in my days, we used to get a little pig at Christmas, mm-hmm. just after Christmas, get a little pig and feed it all the year and Christmas time, they kill it and... Uh, and roast it on a spit? <laughs> not too big for the spit. Uh-huh. <laughs> they used to to make special uh, something that it keeps for weeks, but don't do it these days, these days. They didn't have no fridges, they didn't have refrigeration. Now it's a different kettle of fish. Now they got the, when I first uh, went back home to visit my parents, I bought them. The first thing I bought them was fridge. Mm-hmm. Not many houses could afford to buy. And uh, they never had even a radio, some houses. You know, it was poor. But now they're keeping up, sort of. <laughs> Better life. My village, and they, they go there and work and make money. 
That's what you send out here to do. Yeah, they go, they go to Australia and plenty of work, plenty of money. You didn't think the streets were paved with gold, though, did you? Me, I, I didn't think anything, Mr. Wilton. <laughs> if you see all the others go, so I must, I must go myself, you know, excited. But when I got on the way, you know, and I was uh, on, the, on the ship, one on top of the other was sleeping in uh, mm. bunks. It was terrible. <laughs> I get seasick and uh, all that, you know, bug of that. So they were, I guess what I was thinking was, were they sending you, hoping that you would uh, be able to make a good living in, in, in Australia? or well, it was America before that, and my, let me see, grandfather, my grandfather had uh, two sons in America. Okay. And the Americans were sending food, uh, clothes, things. Okay. Because of the war, you know, they keep sending stuff and they say, oh, they're rich. Mm -hmm. Sending all these things from America mm -hmm. to, to them. And you go to Australia, you do the same as the Americans. Mm -hmm. Make money and have everything you wish. It would have been very hard. But I guess, I guess also they were, they were hoping, I'm imagining, for that you would be in a much more stable environment where you could be more, yeah, you would have a better life. Probably they don't think, you know, what, what's there. What yeah, the, okay. They don't been somewhere to have a look. And, but we can judge because we lived in a different... I think you must have been an amazing young man at 15 to have come to a country where you didn't speak any of the language. That's hard enough mm. without any other things happening. The guy I, didn't turn up to me. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> it's, if I was imagining putting myself in that position. If I'd arrived in a strange country where I'd Fif at 15, I uh, yeah, didn't speak the language. Yeah, uh, mature at 15. Yeah, I, I, I would be that. quite, uh, I would be more than worried. I would well, be I would be a little bit scared look, looking around. Scared. Not. But you didn't, you didn't feel that at that yeah, time? Yeah, I did feel that. I uh, didn't have anybody to tell. <laughs> okay. Amazing. I don't know. I think you must have been remarkable, really. Oh, well, when, through you, it all. when you get to that position, you just have to carry on. I mean, if that man didn't happen to come and sit on my, next to me in the restaurant and give the... Five pounds, five pounds was one week's wages, eh? Five pounds and give five pounds to send me where I had to go. I don't know, sometimes. Well, he, was a, he was ever so kind yeah. to do that. And the, but we were talking about that the other day, that the trust, those days, the trust, he didn't think of anything that could go wrong. Mm. But today, your first thoughts would be... Yeah. Yeah, but I guess also at that time there would have been a lot of other, I mean, new Greek migrants there, and they were all trying to help each other because they've had the similar, you've had a similar experience, I guess. So uh, I think something which would make me unhappy, because I said to this person, you gave me your name and address, and I sent you the money. Mm -hmm. You don't think he ever did? And uh, he said, don't worry about that. I said, no, please, you know, just... And he gave it to me. And when I went to the person pick me up, and I told him how I got there, and I said, this is the name and the address of this person, and the first money I'm going to get from work, I want to send five dollars to that person. Oh, sure. Five pounds, it would have been. Five, five pounds. That's a lot of money those days. A week's wage. And uh, after a while, he gave me, I don't remember how much. And I said, what about the five pounds for that person? I said, I'll send it. Uh, I already sent it. And the uh, next day, I asked him if he give me the note mm -hmm. with his name and address to write him and uh, thank you, you know, because I, I didn't feel not to do it. You know. And they say, check it out. Check, they say, send the money and I throw it out. So 
auf den Wander, die für Eva sendet. talking before about when you first came to Australia you didn't speak any any English not at all so how did you manage to uh, learn English eventually and was it how difficult was it for you I didn't you? go to school at all I had to work so we just have to from the work try to learn a little bit few words every day and slowly slowly and uh, when you're young you can keep them I remember them but now myself I'm hopeless I can't <laughs> I can't remember nothing. But do you um, do you remember any uh, like your experiences of where you first felt like you could communicate with Australians? Do you remember how long that took? I, I reckon six months we started, you know, communicating, learning half Greek, half English, mix them up. And, yeah. <laughs> and uh, when you work in a small country towns, there's not many. Greeks or whatever to so you have to try to have some sort of conversation with your locals uh, you learn a little bit in and I guess in country towns uh, in Australia people tend to have strong accent and use more sl- use a bit more slang mm-hmm, yeah. what, what, what ways was life different here compared to what you experienced in Greece well I didn't have any life in Greece I was school kid and uh, there was very bad years and uh, people dying from hunger and from war and uh, we didn't even have uh, electricity at night because of this uh, situation in way how bad that we have everything bad so <laughs> you wouldn't call that life <laughs> yeah it was a hell <laughs> yeah so but after you know, after the war finish and the locals sorted it out different now it's different so have you, uh, I guess you've been ba- you've been back to Mytilene since many times. And how how had it changed? What what was noticeable for you? Well, the moving I had with the rest of the country. So, you know, they dressed better. They go to the restaurants and they enjoy themselves. The clubs, bars, uh, the climate is beautiful. To go to to the, to the beach and everything different now, much. Uh, tourism now, they go by the millions every year. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, they don't fight among themselves, which uh, they've been okay. I'm interested in the, in the Greek community when you first arrived in Tasmania. Well, what was it like uh, living in Hobart at that time, especially as part of the Greek community? Well, the Greek community was about uh, maybe 20 families, and they all had shops. Casimatis uh, was, uh, I don't know if you heard about them, <clears throat> and they had a restaurant and a fish shop, and uh, the bulk of the young Greeks that come when they went to work in, uh, for the hydro, must be five, six hundred young Greeks uh, there. And, weekends come to town and spend money and join and back to work and did Greek community did you do lots of uh, things together like did you do any many activities or socialize no. or, or, or organized activities well yes the families they used to get together weekends and have a barbecue go fishing go hire a bus the community used to hire a bus and driver and turn the the island, stay a couple of nights and so on. And now they don't, don't do these things. Barbecues then, you, you used to have this lamb on the spit, but the lamb was uh, $15 a yeah. whole lamb. Now you want $30 for a kilo. Yeah, and I guess then it was fairly easy to get lamb in Tasmania. Of course, Tasmania is best in Australia. <laughs> Tell me about some of the um, work you've done with the Greek community in Tasmania. I service in the uh, in community many different with many different uh, the presidents uh, and uh, and a few presidents mm-hmm. in, in the committees. Yes. Well, I, mean, uh, I think you must have been on a lot somehow. And just out of curiosity, curiosity for myself, 
did the Greek community help finance people who were struggling that came out here? Oh yes, I think yeah. yeah. Yes. Help them financially. Yes, yes. yes, that's that's a very important yes. thing, I think. Yes. So how did you go about that? Yeah, what did um what what were some examples of um how the Greek community helped people? Well if they have uh, health problems, they do anything to in any way to do it, to help. Financially. And, yeah, so helping raise money. Yes, uh, yeah, but if uh, if they want to go holiday, buy something, they say get lost. But you know, if they health wise, you know, if yeah. if somebody loses something somebody and in trouble they, they help. Because it's it seems to me that um, a very important part of Greek culture is a sense of community and being being together. Well for instance uh, not very long ago the Greek colony needs a lot of uh, upgrading and they don't do, do as much as they used to do before because the new generation is mm -hmm. different and uh, before they used to hire it for weddings and all that, but nothing much happening there. And they had to do some things, and uh, they send a note to the members, you know, the nations, you know, a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars something, and they get enough money to do. But they don't do it all the time, maybe once in a couple of years or something. The thing with my age group, we're getting less and less because the old ones dying and the young ones that don't come with the old ones, what's left, you know. And uh, now when I go there two, three times a week, you know, to ever give me cards or bricks, it's uh, everyone dies, mm. there's no replacement. The young ones, they got different. Yeah, and, and also just... Uh there's no, hasn't been any many Greek migrants coming here for the last 30 plus years. So you're relying on the second, third generation. Yes, and uh, we're getting there less and less before full club. Never my 12, 15 people. Yeah. But, uh, with the same and the same ones we go back. Well, a couple of weeks ago, one died. It's finished, one, no replacement, nobody there. The young ones have got different type. But are there any um, sort of traditions or, or, or aspects of Greek culture that you would like the next, the younger generation to continue? Yes, we would like to. Uh, well, now, Saturday night they had, uh, at the club, they had music, music and a couple of uh, instruments and uh, food and drink. And the uh, one they had before, the romantic one, was very success. And they had it on top of the club, but now they moved it into the hall because there's more room. All, even all of the Greek-born Tasmanians are, are, are mostly pretty old, or are there still still some young younger ones? Well, there there's still a few young a few young ones, but they keep to themselves to their gr group, mm -hmm. their age group. If there's something special in Greek in the Greek in the church. And the young ones, the other day, there was must be three, three, four hundred that couldn't fit in. It was a special day. Other times, you don't see many young ones. Mm. In the church. 